is repeat after me, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. Hallelujah. Please take your seats and open your Bibles with me, please, to Jeremiah 19, verses 1 through 13 is what we're going to read this morning. Sister Smith is going to read for us in the Korean language. Sister Smith, please. Thank you. 오늘 이 시간 저희들에게 주신 말씀입니다. 예레미야 19장 1절에서 13절입니다. 여호와께서 이와 같이 말씀하시되 가서 토기장의 옹기를 사고 백성의 어른들과 제사장의 어른 및 사람과 하시드문 어귀 곁에 있는 흰놈의 아들의 골짜기로 가서 거기서 내가 내게 이런 말을 선포하여 말하기를 너희 유다 왕들과 예루살렘 주민아 여호와의 말씀을 들으라 망군의 여호와 이스라엘의 하나님이 이같이 말씀하시되 보라 내가 이곳에 재앙을 내릴 것이라 그것을 듣는 모든 자의 귀가 떨리니 이는 그들이 나를 버리고 이곳을 불결하게 하며 이곳에서 자기와 자기 조상들과 유다 왕들이 알지 못하던 다른 신들에게 분양하며 무죄한 자의 피로 이곳에 채웠음이며 또 그들이 바알을 위하여 산당을 전축하고 자기 아들들을 바알에게 번제로 불살라 드렸나니 이는 내가 명령하거니와 말하거나 뜻한 바가 아니니라 그러므로 보라 다시는 이곳을 도배시나 흰놈의 아들의 골짜기라 부르지 아니하고 오직 죽음의 골짜기라 부르는 날이 이를 것이라 여호와의 말이니라 내가 이곳에서 유다와 예루살렘의 계획을 무너뜨려 그들로 그 대적 앞과 생명을 찾는 자의 손을 칼에 엎드러지게 하고 그 시체를 공중의 새와 땅의 짐승의 밥이 되게 하며 이 성읍으로 놀람과 조롱거리가 되게 하리니 그 모든 재앙으로 말미암아 지나는 자마다 놀라며 조롱할 것이며 그들이 그들의 그들이 그들의 원수와 그들의 생명을 찾는 자에게 둘러싸여 공경에 빠질 때에 내가 그들이 그들의 아들의 살 딸의 살을 먹게 하고 또 각기 친구의 살을 먹게 하리라 하셨다 하고 너는 함께 가서 자의 목전에서 그 온기를 깨뜨리고 그들에게 이르기를 망군의 여호와께서 이와 같이 말씀하시되 사람이 토기장의 그릇을 한번 깨뜨리면 다시 완전하게 할수 없나니 이와 같이 내가 이 백성과 이 성읍을 무너뜨리리니 도벳에 매장할 자리가 없을 만큼 매장하리라. 아멘. Jeremiah 19 verses 1 through 13. 1 through 13. You stop too soon? Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. 여호와의 말씀이니라 내가 이곳과 그 가운데 주민에게 이같이 행하여 이 성읍으로 도배깎게 할 것이니라 예루살렘 집들과 유다 왕들의 집들이 그집 위에서 하늘의 만상에 분양하고 다른 신, 신들에게 전제를 부름으로 더러워졌은 즉 도배 땅처럼 내리라 하셨다 하라 하시니 아멘 아멘 Actually I think the people of Jerusalem wanted God to stop there too Okay, Jeremiah 19, 1 through 13. This is what the Lord says. Go and buy a clay jar from a potter. Take along some of the elders of the people and of the priests and go out to the valley of Ben-Hinnom near the entrance of the Putshod Gate. There proclaim the words I tell you and say, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah and people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Listen, I am going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They have burned sacrifices in it to gods that neither they nor their fathers, nor the kings of Judah ever knew. And they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. 
They have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. So beware, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer call this place Topeth or the Valley of Ben-Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. In this place I will ruin the plans of Judah and Jerusalem. I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who seek their lives. And I will give their carcasses as food to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. I will devastate this city and make it an object of scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters, and they will eat one another's flesh during the stress of the siege imposed on them by the enemies who seek their lives. Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. They will bury the dead in Topeth until there is no more room. This is what I will do to this place and to those who live here, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Topeth the houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place. Topeth, all the houses where they burned incense on the roof to all the sorry hosts and poured out drink offerings to other gods. Amen. May the Lord add blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word, and I thank you for this message and I thank you, Lord, for these people who are here this morning. May all our hearts be soft, Lord. May we be pliable. May we hear you and see you, Lord. And may, Lord, your good and perfect will be accomplished this morning. May your spirit be strong with us, Lord, for your glory. Please help us to draw near to you. And please help us to do your perfect will. For it is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning I'm speaking to you about sin unrepented or unrepented sin. Either way you say it, it doesn't sound good. I tried to make it sound better by saying uh, sin unrepented, but it's really unrepented sin, is it not? I know we're here in Jeremiah 19 this morning, but I want to look back and think a little bit about Jeremiah 18. Because remember, Jeremiah, he had a very hard assignment from God. It was to go and tell God's people that their sins had consequences. And not only did their sins have consequences, but judgment was coming from God, the one and only great judge. And if you remember in Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah was told to go down, go down to the potter's house. And watch him at the potter's wheel while he's creating beautiful, fine clay pots. The vessel that the potter was making at that time did not turn out as he had hoped, so he crushed it and, and to a lump of clay and started all over again. Remember? I hope you remember last week. The Lord made it clear to Israel by saying, As the clay is in the potter's hand, so you are in my hand. God is at work. Maybe we don't see it. Maybe we don't understand it. But God is constantly, constantly at work molding and fashioning the clay into a vessel that he can use. We, you and I, we are the clay and we're always in the hands of the potter. He knows exactly what he wants us to look like, the vessel to look like, and, and what he desires to use us for. But yet we rebel and resist. But he knows, I think personally, that these verses show God's love for his people. But the next few verses 
show a clear warning to them as well. God said in Jeremiah 18, 11, I'm still back in chapter 18, Now therefore say to the people of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says. Look, I am preparing a disaster for you and devising a plan against you. So turn from your evil ways, each one of you, and reform your ways and your actions. I don't know how to say this. I don't know what could be worse than God telling you that. If he is preparing a disaster for you and he has a plan against you, what could be worse than that? We're talking God Almighty here, right? And I think these are some very strong and serious words that he has spoken to not just anybody. He is speaking to his chosen people. This illustrates, I think, the extent of his love for them. Now, you may say, wait a minute, but think about this. There are severe consequences that come when God's people refuse to repent of their sins. If they continue down the road, continue to do what God tells them not to, what God says he doesn't want them to do, or he tells them to do something they don't, do they not deserve punishment? Most of you would punish your children if they did that, if you're a good parent. And it's very obvious that they didn't repent. Even though God told them time and time again, they didn't repent. In fact, they conceived an evil plot against Jeremiah, of all people, for delivering these words, these warnings to them. In fact, Jeremiah 18, 18 says, They said, Come, let's make plans against Jeremiah, for the teaching of the law by the priest did not cease, nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. So come. Let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. Sound familiar? Jeremiah was not the enemy. He wasn't the enemy. But they thought he was. They accused him. And they treated him as such. They treated him as if he was the enemy. In fact, he was an advocate for them. He was on the people's side. He was trying to help them. He was attempting or trying to spare them from the trouble. He was trying to get them to change. He was trying to get them to see the truth. He was crying out to the people. He kept crying out, danger's coming, danger's coming. But they ignored his warning. And not only did they ignore his warning, they turned from him. They turned against him, not just ignoring him. They wanted to hurt him. They wanted to hurt him for telling the truth and trying to help them. As a result, Jeremiah himself got angry. I don't understand that. You know I do because we all do, don't we? Jeremiah was angered and he seeks the Lord and he, and he sort of shares his burden with God. If you read it, you may think his response was sort of harsh, actually. But I want you to see that he didn't, in his response, if you want to go back and read it later on, in his response, even though it was harsh, he didn't seek vengeance through his own power. Because, see, Jeremiah knew something. He realized the principle. And the principle from God is, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. So basically... What he was saying is, Lord, I wish you would smash these people, but, you know, it's up to you. Your will be done. Your will be done. And Jeremiah was not speaking of the heathens here, non-believers. He was referring to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. There's something this morning that I need you to understand. I need you to understand this. If, and that's a little word, but it's really important. If God's people did not turn back to God, 
Judah and Jerusalem would be taken over by heathen nations. Pure and simple. God calls for the elders and the leaders to hear Jeremiah's warning and to listen, and then he wanted them to repent. All they had to do was repent. He tells them that if they continue this practice that are not from God, that consequences will happen. Some say they cannot imagine God doing such terrible things or allowing such terrible things to happen. You know, I hear it today. I hear people tell me, well, wait a minute. You mean God's going to let people go to hell? You mean that love in God that you talk about, that you care about, allows babies to die? He allows things to happen out there. He does this. Listen, God didn't do it. God didn't do this. In fact, God is warning his people against it. He's warning them, and he's warning you and me. He's warning us today, even today. We need to repent and come back to him. As we arrive here at chapter 19, I was think you probably thinking, well, when's he ever going to get to our scripture today? I think we find a very painful account of the danger of unrepentant sin. I want you to keep in mind that these people had plenty opportunities to turn from their wicked lifestyles. They had opportunities to change. They had opportunities to repent. God sent his prophets, Jeremiah being one, but not the only one. And he had, they had his word. They knew the history. They knew everything. They had more than enough opportunities to repent and they didn't. You see what happens when God's people fail to repent? What happens? At God's instruction, Jeremiah took several leaders and priests with him on a little walk, like a little field trip. They went to the valley of ben Hinnom. Jeremiah was to deliver another message from God by showing an example and giving a physical example of a spiritual thing. And God tells the people, he says, listen, listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. Brothers and sisters, that word tingle there is not a good thing. It's not good. Let's think about it and look at our scripture for a minute. First, we have the sin. The sin, I think, here in our scripture is clearly explained. Look again at verses 4 and 5 of our text. 4 and 5 of our text, and follow along as I read it again. That's Jeremiah 19, 4 and 5. For they have forsaken me and made this a place of foreign gods. They burnt sacrifices in it to gods that neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah ever knew, and they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. They have built the high places of Baal to burn their sons in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. Amen. God, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, God never has, and he never will tolerate sin. And if you think he will, if you think he'll just say, oh, that's okay, then you don't know God. He cannot and he will not ever tolerate sin. He proclaims that the discipline that he gives will be so terrible that those who hear it, their ears will tingle. Now, Jeremiah said back in Jeremiah 10.10, 10, he said, The Lord is a true God. He is a living God, the eternal King. When he is angry, the earth trembles, and the nations cannot, that word right there, the nations cannot endure his wrath. That's what Jeremiah said back in 10.10. 10. Think about this. 
The discipline of sin is what caused Adam and Eve to be cast from the Garden of Eden. The discipline of sin is the reason you and I are born as sinners and sinful. It was discipline of sin that caused the great flood in Noah's time. It was the discipline of sin that caused Lot's troubles and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the discipline of sin that kept Moses from entering the promised land. It was the discipline of sin that caused all of David's troubles. It was the discipline of sin that caused all the troubles for God's people that we read in his word. And it is discipline from God that causes some of the issues that you and I are having today. Whether it's your sin or the sin of the world, it's because of sin that we have trouble today. I don't care what it is. It's a result of sin. And not only that, not only are we facing discipline of sin today, we are facing discipline of sin in the future. Unrepentant sin brings discipline in the lives of God's children. It happens. I don't like it, but I know it's true. Just because we don't like it, just because we disagree, I can tell you right now, that won't stop it from happening. And it's a disgrace. Unrepentant sin brings disgrace. Look at verses 8 and 9 of our text. I'd like to read them again, please. Verses 8 and 9 of our text. Follow along as I read them, please. I will just devastate this city and make it an object of scorn, and all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff because of all its wounds. And I will make them eat the flesh of their sons and daughters, and they will eat one another's flesh during the stress of the siege imposed on them by the enemies who seek their lives. I think I skipped some. My wife's shaking her head at me. Can't stand it when she does that. But it is what it is. That's disgrace. Number three, disgrace. You see, Israel would face their disgrace as a result of their unrepentant sin. The place would actually become a monument of their error. When people passed through the desolate city, they would actually gasp at the sight of it. They would be upset. You know, we always know that we're going to have discipline. Discipline's going to come, right? But we got this right here, and now the Lord's going to, the Lord's going to happen, and, and we're going to be disgraced. The place would become a monument, and the Lord would remove the hedge. Well, he would remove his protection, and the enemies would overtake them. Things would become so bad, they would actually have to become cannibals to survive. These people who've experienced God's divine favor would be actually la uh, laughing stocks for their enemies. Their enemies would make fun of them. Not because God was mean to them, but because they would not listen to God. They had experienced God's protection all these years. They had experienced God's provision in the past. But here they have, they have actually forfeited throw away the right to receive God's blessing. They just threw it away. God had blessed them. God had protected them. God had took care of them. But now they have just thrown it away because they disobeyed God. They chose this path. They chose it. 
God didn't choose this path. He chose a better path. He wanted them to follow him. But they would not listen. They had every opportunity to avoid the heartache, but they refused to repent. They refused. Now, they would be disgraced. Brothers and sisters, if we, if we continue to refuse to repent, we will find that it will bring to us a place of disgrace too. If we refuse to repent of our sins and humble ourselves before God, we should expect discipline and disgrace. A place where all the good that maybe we have done, it will be overshadowed by disgrace. And we'll have that disgrace because our sins have brought it to light. Think about that. You ever notice you could be the best there is, and all you got to do is mess up one time. You could be the best worker that your employer has. All you got to do is mess up one time. And all that, you've been faithful, you've been hard working all those years, mess up one time. And that's what everybody remembers. As Christians, it's the same way. Not to God, though, but to the world. And we will be disgraced. Then there's devastation. Number four. Devastation. Unrepentant sin brings devastation. If you look at verses 10 through 13, verses 10 through 13 of our text, and follow along as I read, please. Then break the jar while those who go with you are watching and say to them, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation and this city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. And they will bury the dead in Topeth until there is no more room. And this is what I will do to this place and to those who live there, declares the Lord. I will make this city like Topeth. The houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place. Topeth will all the houses where they burned incense on the roof to all the sorry hosts and poured out drink offerings to other gods. Amen. The Lord instructs Jeremiah here to smash the jar that he brought with him. And he told them, just like the jar is shattered, so will the Lord shatter the people of Judah and Jerusalem. The Lord will not tolerate idolatry. Anything that comes before God is an idol and is subject to destruction. Brothers and sisters, I warn you now, be very careful. Whatever you put before God, there's a good chance that thing will be destroyed or you'll lose it. Be very careful what you put before God. Notice in our word here that nothing was immune to this destruction. The people suffered the consequences. The rulers suffered. Houses and property would be destroyed. The enemies of Israel would be victorious over them, and people would die. I have to ask you this question. What comes before God in your life? What comes before God in your life? Is it worth God using that idol to get your attention? And don't think he wouldn't because he did here. He's done it before. He may do it again. God will not tolerate unrepentant sin in our lives. And you may find that when you refuse to repent, it will bring devastation. 
Now, just because God is slow to anger and very patient with us, don't think that he's weak or that he's not going to do something. God is patient and loving and gives us every opportunity to repent. He gives us more than enough time. He gives us so much opportunity because there's love for us. And finally, there's death. Unrepentant sin brings death. We've already read verses 11 and 12 back in, uh, and back in verse 7, though, God says, I will make them fall by the sword before their enemies at the hands of those who want to kill them, and I will give their carcasses as food to the birds and to the wild animals. To put it simple as I can, you cannot sin and get away with it. That's pretty simple. I don't know how to say it more simple than that. You cannot sin and get away with it. Sin has to be paid for. Sin has to be paid for. The consequences are real and they are severe. You will never be able to say that you did not have a chance to repent. When you stand before God, when you stand before that judgment seat, you cannot say, well, I didn't have a chance to repent, God. I didn't have a chance because he's going to give you lots of chances. So in conclusion, the divine potter, if you will, is still at the wheel of our lives and he has a desire to make something out of us, out of you, out of me. God wants to make something good that he can use out of us. We are allowed many do-overs. That's what I'll call it. You know, he he has remade me so many times. And he allows it because of his mercy and grace. Our mistakes are forgiven with repentance. Jesus paid the price for our sins. He became our sin, and he died for our sin. But we can't reject him and expect there to be no consequences. We can't reject the gift. We can't reject Jesus. We can't just say, yeah, he did it. Okay. We have to repent of our sins. We have to come to him and accept him as our Lord and Savior. Don't jump off the potter's wheel. You know, we're tempted to jump off that wheel when he's trying to really do something amazing in our lives. God has promised, because he has patience and he has persistence. God is persistent. He doesn't give up on us. He's patient. He doesn't throw the clay out because he wants to be making something out of your life. But we must repent. You see the evidence right here before you, brothers and sisters. We must repent. You know, life, I know, life can be pretty painful sometimes, can it? But God never gives up on us. I know that some of you may want to give up almost daily because life is a struggle, especially in this sinful world when we're trying to follow a holy, righteous, one and only God. It can be rough in this world. It really can be. And I know you may you want to give up. And you know what? Sometimes we all feel that way sometimes, don't we? But let God finish in you what he has started. Some of you may be running from God and his warnings today, but remember this, his warnings won't last forever. His warnings won't last. If you've never given your life over to Jesus Christ, that is the first step of salvation. You have to give your life to Jesus. Admit that you are a sinner and that you not only want to acknowledge it, but you want to repent of it. You must be willing to turn away from your sin. 
today by choice, by choice, you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. For others, maybe you need to acknowledge that there's stuff in your life that needs to go away because they have become between you and your Lord Jesus. And you want your relationship with the Lord Jesus restored. You want it to be the way it should be. Most of us feel that way many times. Thank God he's waiting with open arms. Thank God he warns us. Won't you do that today? Please, let us pray.